Thank you for joining us for the Glory to God in the Highest and on Earth piece, the Christmas Story and Art webinar with Richard Blackburn. My name is Audrey Voth Petka, and I'm the president of Tour Imagination. We, as some of you know, we are a Canadian travel company that has helped North American people of faith explore, expand, and experience their worlds for more than 50 years. We specialize in Anabaptist heritage tours, faith-related tours, and unique cultural experiences. Tonight, we are excited to learn about the artists expressing their faith by depicting key episodes surrounding the birth of Jesus. God's incarnation in Christ has inspired artists throughout the history of the church. This slide illustrated webinar will reflect on images of Christ's nativity, the Annunciation to the Shepherds, and the Adoration of the Shepherds, as represented in the great art of the past. Art historian Richard Blackburn will highlight how the Christmas story has been interpreted by artists from the early Christian and medieval eras through the Renaissance and the Baroque period. Before I introduce our presenter, I want to tell you what's happening in the webinar tonight. After I introduce Richard, he will share his presentation. During his presentation, you can post questions and comments in the chat. And then after that, Richard will answer those questions from all of you. We will end our time together with a brief overview of Richard's upcoming Pilgrim of Faith and Art in Florence tour, happening September 17 to 25, 2024. So next September. So let's begin. Richard Blackburn is an art historian, as well as a conflict transformation consultant and family systems coach for pastors seeking to manage self in the midst of congregational anxieties. From 1983 to 2020, he served as executive director of the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center. He previously taught art history at Trinity College, Goshen College, and Northern Illinois University with a specialization in medieval and Italian Renaissance art. He also taught conflict transformation and mediation skills at Southern Methodist University, Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary, and Goshen College. He has taught in a number of international settings, including Serbia, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Israel-Palestine. Most relevant for our upcoming tour, each summer between 2006 and 2013, he taught a course in Florence, Italy for Southern Methodist University, which included lecturing in the museums and churches on the theme of conflict as an impetus to creativity in Italian Renaissance art. Please welcome Richard Blackburn. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, so that I can start getting out my slides and we can start the presentation. And I'll have to hide that band at the top. There. And move some of you over to the side so I can see my slides too. <clears throat> and if you see me looking to my right, it's because I've got a second computer where I'm going to have you on gallery view so I can see you folks as well, uh, and particularly when we open it up to questions. Okay, so our purpose is to look at uh, the Christmas story in art, uh, and sometimes my slide thing uh, freezes uh, before starting it. There. So um, beginning with what's the earliest surviving image that alludes to the incarnation, this is a uh, painting from the catacombs of Priscilla coming from the early third century. And what you see is a prophet figure who is pointing to this image of the Mandarian child. It's in fresco, but you can see that it's per poorly preserved, but still a very important image in the development of the iconography of the incarnation. And it was during this time that theological discussions focused on demonstrating how Christ's coming actually reflected the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. 
So the prophet here could be Balaam, it could be Isaiah or other prophets who uh, foretold the coming of the Messiah. But in all, all likelihood, it probably is intended to recall the whole of the prophetic testimony that foretold the coming of the Messiah. And so the Holy Child, who you see being cradled gently in a gesture of maternal protection, is the one who signifies that fulfillment of the ancient promise. Now, the earliest images of the nativity itself actually maintain the simplicity of the biblical account. Here you see a sarcophagus lid from the fourth century that is not necessarily a narrative of the theme, but is meant to convey the universal importance of the incarnation. You see the Christ child lying in a manger between a, beneath a lean-to roof of a stable, and that conveys the idea that the divine king has entered the world in all of its poverty in order to save it. And Mary sits almost unconcernedly to the right with her mantle wrapped about her uh, like a, a Roman matron, and you don't even see Joseph at all. The image focuses more on the recognition of the Christ child by the Jews and the Gentiles, so that the shepherd standing to the right of the manger, you see him raising his hand in a gesture of joy and worship, uh, having witnessed Christ's birth. The three magi actually join the scene to the left as they follow the star placed above the post of the stable. And so the shepherd represents that part of the church that emerged out of Judaism, the magi that which emerged out of the Gentile world. And so both are here coming to honor the child who breaks down the dividing wall between earthly enemies. And the donkey and the ox actually reinforce that same theme because from the third century on, theologians related the words of Isaiah 1-3 to the Bethlehem manger. The ox knows its owner and the ass its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. And so it was understood that the ox represents the chosen Jewish people, while the ass serves as a symbol of the pagan world, that Gentile element of the church. And so between the ox, which is yoked to the law, and the ass, which is loaded with the sins of idolatry, lies the Son of God, who brings freedom from both burdens. The next development in the iconography of the Nativity is illustrated in this ivory panel from the ivory throne of Archbishop Maximian, coming from the mid-6th century. And this is um, an indication of how Mary begins to occupy a more prominent place in nativity images after the fifth century. And that was a key time because it was in the year 431 that the Council of Ephesus declared Mary to be the Theotokos, the mother of God. And that signaled the beginning of her ascendancy in the theology of the Catholic Church uh, and the worship of Mary. And so it's from the sixth century on that she becomes a second focal point in nativity images. So you see her lying on a couch, known in Byzantine iconography as a clina, to indicate her exhaustion after giving birth, emphasizing the idea that Jesus is indeed a man born of a woman. And the woman showing her hand to Mary relates to the apocryphal story of the midwife who doubted the miraculous birth, the virgin nature of it. And so that her hand withered when she doubted, and it was only healed again after she examined Mary and then came to believe that she was indeed a virgin. And Joseph appears in the upper left with his open palm gesture, suggesting awe at the power of God. You see the Christ child lying in a high structure that looks more like an altar, and it indeed reflects the very condition at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, the church that had been built in the fourth century by Constantine after his mother, Helena, made a visit there. And so that it really does show that altar that was in that church. And so the altar then draws a connection between the iconography or the incarnation of Christ and his atoning death, because it was on that altar that that death was mystically reenacted by a, the celebration of the Eucharist. And so it alludes to the fact that his sacrificial death was a part of God's plan at the beginning and actually is 
an underlying assumption even at his birth. In these 11th century images, you see the culmination of the development of nativity iconography as it became canonized in the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, from the mid-Byzantine period on. You see a manuscript illumination at the top and a monumental mosaic decoration from the church of Hosius Lucas on the right bottom. And you see similar elements that we've uh, seen before, the altar-like manger, the ox and the donkey appear again, and they become common elements of nativity iconography. And you also see a reference to the apocryphal story of the midwives who actually now bathe the Christ child. But there are also new elements. Joseph here assumes a more pensive pose to convey his distress at Mary's pain in giving birth. And you also see an allusion to the next episode in the story with on the far right of each composition is an allusion to the Annunciation to the Shepherds. And in the mosaic decoration at Hosius Lucas on the far left, you also see the Magi approaching. But you, what we have not seen before is the cave of the Nativity. And this subsequently became the most distinguishing feature of the Byzantine Nativity type. So that the dark interior of the cave was seen to symbolize the darkness of the world into which Christ has come, while above the cave, you see the heavenly light shines, its rays reaching the child in order to testify to his origin in divine light. So the cave of the nativity is something that's mentioned in the earliest legends and theological writings from the church's history. And so it really is believed that it was in this cave that the Christ child was born because it reflects the local situation in Bethlehem where stables were hewn out of the rocks under the houses. And it does reflect the actual condition at the church in the nativity built over that grotto that served as a stable uh, originally. And it's when you descend into the grotto of the nativity beneath the high altar at the church in the nativity in Bethlehem that you're entering what has traditionally believed to be the very site of Christ's birth. In Western medieval art, uh, the nativity evolved initially out of early Christian sarcophagi reliefs. Here's an example from the Carolingian era, the time of Charlemagne, from the Lorsch Gospels book cover. At the bottom, you see this ivory carving of the nativity scene. And so this carving revives that early Christian type that shows the scene taking place in a stable. And you see Mary reclining in a pose that's similar to what we saw in Byzantine art and also Joseph in that pensive gesture. So it does suggest that some Byzantine examples were making their way to the West where artists were being influenced by that. And the tower that is unique here is representing David's palace, that that is intended to refer to the Davidic ancestry of the Messiah. As Western medieval art evolved, gradually a more maternal affection of Mary toward the infant Jesus began to emerge. In this uh, earlier example from a German Romanesque era, you see that there's still a distant relationship between mother and child in this ivory carving. But as you look at the French Gothic example from Chartres Cathedral, you see that there is beginning to be a more tender human relationship between mother and child, even Joseph becomes more domestic as he offers more swaddling clothes to Mary. Sadly, Joseph's head was lopped off during the French Revolution, and it's recently been uh, proposed that a head that is in the Metropolitan Museum of New York uh, is that head that somehow made its way to New York. In late medieval Italy, depictions of the nativity became increasingly more naturalistic. This is Giotto's example from the Arena Chapel, in Pandova in northern Italy. And in this example, you see that he's combining both the cave of Byzantine tradition and the attached roof suggesting a stable from his own Western artistic heritage. Here, Joseph not only sits in isolation, but he's also asleep. It seems that his three dreams as recounted by Nath Matthew have been in interpolated into this image of the nativity. Above the stable, angels dance in near cin cinematographic fashion 
almost looks like a stop action photograph as they announce the Messiah's birth to the shepherds and sing their glorious song of praise. Most significantly for the emotional impact of the work is the way Giotto shows a serving woman handing the child to Mary after having lifted him from the wooden manger in order to lay him beside his mother. And this attitude of tender affection can largely be attributed to the influence of Francis of Assisi, who often gave explicit expression to the special love he espoused for the Christ child. Also under the influence of Franciscan piety was the emergence of an entirely new nativity type toward the end of the 14th century. And this emerged as a result of the uh, visit of St. Bridget of Sweden, who made a visit to the Holy Land and recounts in her revelations how she was praying in the Grotto of the Nativity and was granted a mystical reenactment of Christ's birth, where she show, says that she sh saw the Christ child emerge miraculously from the Virgin's womb, that the Virgin gave birth without pain or travail, and that Mary then knelt down and worshiping Je worshiped Jesus, who was shining with the light of divine essence. And you see those elements of the nativity here uh, in this image. And you also see St. Bridget in a diminutive figure to the right. Uh, so that this, this is an image that seeks to capture uh, that experience that she had in the grotto of the nativity in Bethlehem. And Gentile de Fabriano's 1423 nativity actually derives its devotional elements from that vision of St. Bridget. The setting does include the cave from Byzantine iconography and a stone structure, which is falling into ruins. And uh, the ruins represent the ancient religions that are here being superseded by the coming of Christ, whose new church, as symbolized by the wooden shed, built atop the fallen religions of antiquity. Joseph dreams to the right again and is balanced on the left by midwives who again have their origin in Byzantine art. Above Joseph, we do see the Annunciation to the Shepherds in the background. But specifically, Bridgetine is the motif of having the Christ child lying uncovered on the ground, an element that serves to highlight God's willingness to share our human frailty and vulnerability through the incarnation. The child is radiant with the light of divine essence, and it provides the primary source of illumination in the foreground of the work. And this actually is one of the earliest attempts by an artist to depict the nativity as having taken place at night. The Brigitine source is underscored as we see Mary bow down in worship of the newborn king, so that she is indeed our model for humbling ourselves before the Lord of creation, worshiping him, giving all praise and glory and honor to him. That Brigitine nativity type did become popular in Northern Europe as well. This is a work by the Dutch artist, Hertigen Tutsen Jans, and uh, you, he's known for his doll-like figures with shoe button eyes, uh, one of the cute features of his works. And what you see here is the way the light that shines from the Christ child communicates that sense of warm, warm intimacy and deep inner peace that belongs to those who experience the true meaning of Christmas and know the frail infant king as savior and Lord. That Brigitine type ultimately evolved into a new image that's not specifically depicting the nativity, illustrated here by Piotr de Cosimo's adoration of the Christ child. And you do see some elements of the nativity in the background to the left, where Joseph sleeps in front of a cave and accompanied by the ox and the donkey. But the focus is on the foreground, where you see Mary kneeling in worship before the sleeping Christ child. And this image of the sleeping Christ child is actually an allusion to his coming death. That's how Renaissance viewers would have understood it. And so that uh, below him in a pool of water that's very hard to see in the slide, you'll have to go to Toledo and look at the detail in the original painting. But when you do get a chance to look at it closely, what you see will be tadpoles swimming in the water um, beneath that rock formation that Jesus lies on. And the tadpoles would have been transformed, right? Just as the 
then Christ will be transformed in his resurrection. This Brigittine attitude of worship uh, also characterizes Lorenzo Lotto's nativity. Here, Joseph joins Mary in worship, uh, and Mary's arms are crossed over her chest, which is a symbol of her submission to God's will. In images of the Annunciation, sometimes you see her uh, with this gesture of arms crossed uh, that is a symbol of the words from the gospel where she says to the angel, let it be to me according to thy word. Above, angels join in the worship experience as they sing their words of praise, words that they apparently have not yet memorized as they have to sing from an unfurled musical score. And the artist here to the left includes an obvious reference to his role as savior because the crucifix that you see attached to the wall in the back to the left is the kind of portable devotional object that devout travelers of the day might have carried with them. Never mind that Mary and Joseph would not have had any such object because the message is intended for us, not for them. For here lying in a manger is the child who would grow up to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of humankind. Here is the one who modeled the way of the cross and commands us to take up our cross and follow him, that is, to adopt the way of nonviolence, suffering servanthood, and unconditional love, even for enemies. And so let's pause before we go on to the next episode to see if there are any questions at this point. I would invite uh, people to unmute yourself if you have any questions at this point, uh, or if you wrote something in the chat, maybe Audrey can read it for me. I wrote, uh, Richard, we discussed this uh, last night. Would most of these artists be people of faith? Yes, um, they were people of faith. Uh, and they were people who had actually needed to have some uh, theological training as well in order to uh, understand and depict these symbols that they're including in their works. Uh, that uh, particularly uh, in the medieval era, uh, they would have probably had theological advisors as well, helping them to put the right details. And they would have been uh, looking at earlier works as well that had the details of the various iconographic symbols that they would have put in there too. Um, but uh, it's really through the Renaissance that most artists uh, were indeed people of faith as well into the Baroque era as well. Another question, can you say something about the symbolism of colors, such as the royal blue that Mary is often dressed in over top of the dark peach or red? Yeah, I mean, the color symbolism, uh, Mary showing her in the blue, is really a symbol of royalty, as, as you said. Uh, and the red is a symbol of uh, her sorrow and as well as Christ's passion. So mm -hmm. those are the elements that are typical as well. Does anybody have a question? Just unmute and ask. Otherwise, Richard will continue. I have a question mm -hmm. about there's a, a depiction of Jesus and he he's elongated, uh, really skinny, and and doesn't look like a baby. Yeah, it's and that's typical, uh, particularly of medieval art, where it's not as naturalistic. It's when you get to the Renaissance that uh, the image of the Christ child does become more naturalistic. In many works, uh, there are still some artists that aren't looking at babies when they actually paint the image of Jesus. But if you look at uh, some of the works that we'll see when we take the group to Florence, I'll be pointing out where you see that transition from um, a very unnaturalistic child that also seems almost like a miniature adult and in medieval art, that is intended to communicate his um, uh, all-knowing kind of quality, even as a, a child. Um, but in uh, later Renaissance works, you do see uh, the child looking more like a baby. And I see Erica. Hi, Erica. You've Thank got a you. question. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, kind of a follow-up to that. Is, is that. is it simply that medieval artists didn't have the skill to, to depict people? in a realistic looking way, or did they choose not to? It was a kind of a combination of both. Um, during the uh, ancient period, during the early Christian era that was 
influenced uh, by ancient art. There was some degree of naturalism in some of the depictions. But as you move into the Middle Ages, uh, artists are being trained uh, not so much in a naturalistic style, but in a style that is intended to uh, uh, kind of elicit a faithful response. For instance, in the image that you see on the screen now with the manuscript illumination from the Menologian of the Emperor Vasilius II, uh, you see the gold leaf in the background. That's not naturalistic, but it uh, gives that surface from which light would shine that gives that mystical kind of appearance to it. And in the Middle Ages, there was what I would call more of a transcendental aesthetic that denied logical time-space references and denied the naturalism of things as well. You see the kind of transcendental aesthetic, just showing a symbol of hills rather than trying to show them naturalistically. Uh, okay, Richard, we continue? Yeah. Steve, one more question, and then let's continue. Steve is asking, would you care to comment on modern depictions of the Holy Family and of Mary and Jesus, such as Picasso's mother and child? Well, there are very rare uh, examples in modern art, if that's what you're asking about, Steve, uh, that uh, some of those examples, um, we were on a, a, a trip uh, just uh, this fall, uh, where we were in uh, the, uh, Slovenia and Croatia. And one of the modern examples of uh, the image of the nativity was actually modeled after Byzantine icons. Uh, and so it goes back to the medieval style. So you're going to find a variety of images from the modern era. But of course, they're not as prolific as they were in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. So let's do continue. So the next yes. episode in the story, uh, as depicted here, is the Annunciation to the Shepherds. And you did see this previously, uh, having been combined with uh, images of the Nativity. But that uh, image of the Annunciation to the Shepherds does have a history of its own. One of my favorite examples is this a leaf from an Atonian manuscript illumination that shows an early medieval way of representing that theme that you see that the angel dominates the scene, standing atop these schematicized hills, and indeed uh, the gold leaf of the background, again, illustrating that idea of the glory of the Lord that's shown around him. This is actual gold leaf that's beaten to a thin uh, kind of sheet that is then attached to the uh, parchment of, of the, or the vellum of the manuscript page. Uh, and then you see how the angel's air of otherworldliness is achieved by his son to that transcendental aesthetic, whereby uh, the most important figures in the composition are represented as larger, what we call a convention of hierarchic proportions. Uh, and so the hand raised in speech conveys the message to the shepherds, where he says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. The movement of the angel flows diagonally down to the shepherd, who you see has raised his hand in this open palm gesture of worship of God. And he rushes off to Bethlehem, but still can't take his eyes off the heavenly apparition, causing him, it appears, to throw a hip out of joint. Again, an example of where artists uh, are not depicting things naturalistically. Gothic images of the theme typically convey the joy of the scene by virtue of the rich colors and the decorative linear rhythms. You see an example in stained glass from Chart Cathedral on the left and a manuscript illumination uh, from the Psalter of Robert de Lee. And one of the rare monumental images of the theme is found in the Cappella Baroncelli that we'll see in the Church of Santa Croce in Florence by Taddeo Gaddi. And the image here uh, emphasizes the common bearing of those to whom the message is given. And it's no mistake that God chose to share the good tidings of the birth of his son with the lowly shepherds, because in ancient Israel, they were indeed the poorest of the poor. The more distant shepherds seems uh, just aroused by the heavenly apparition, shielding his eyes from the supernatural glare. 
but his companion has already understood the matter to God. The challenge for the origin, and he captures that beautifully as it flows across the mountainous landscape, which is soon to echo with the angel's glorious song of praise to God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. The pairing of this expression of prayer for peace on earth, in my view, embodies the essence of Christian responsibility. That message makes it clear that the two are inseparable. God, our creator and redeemer, and simultaneously to be faithful in fulfilling our role to sowing the seeds of peace and justice throughout the world. So that I believe that God is glorified in the highest when God's people hear the call to peacemaking and are active partners in Christ's sacred ministry of reconciliation. Toward the end of the medieval era, the Annunciation to the Shepherds as a separate subject became increasingly rare, uh, that typically it would only be included later in as a separate subject in more extensive pictorial cycles, like that of the trade reshores done by the Lamborg brothers. This is just one page from that extensive manuscript. I enjoy seeing this one because in the image here, you see that the heavenly host convey their praise by a musical accompaniment for the angels play various musical instruments and five others sing the Gloria from a shared song sheet as well. One of the shepherds also seems to join the concert of the angels because the shepherd in the middle, if you look closely, it seems like he's playing a bagpipe with the inflated bag under his arm and the chanter, the horn from which the sound emerges rising above his shoulder. And in the Renaissance, this uh, theme of the Annunciation to Shepherds was rarely depicted. Sometimes you see it, as you do on the left, in Northern European art and manuscript illuminations. But even more rarely in Italy do you see it, with one example uh, by Jacopo Bassano that you see here. Baroque artists sought to capture the drama of the scene, as is typical of Baroque images in general. Here, Rembrandt's uh, etching of the scene shows that drama as you see the angel in the detail. By the whole experience. You even see one shepherd running away in fear and the animals stampeding at this uh, apparition of the angel. And you can imagine that it would be frightening. Uh, and indeed, the scripture does say that they were terrified. And so let's pause again. Um, if there are any questions about that element of the Annunciation to the Shepherds. There, no one's posted um, anything in the in the question, in the chat, but somebody may want to unmute and anybody? ask a question. Anybody? No? Nobody yet? Okay, let's okay, continue. Let's go. So it's the message that impelled the shepherds to action, just as we're called to be active in peacemaking today. Uh, and after hearing the message, they made their way to Bethlehem, joined Mary and Joseph in worship, as you see in this image by Taddeo Gaddi, a work that we'll see in the Academia in Florence. Uh, and so this theme of the adoration of the shepherds entered the artistic canon, again, under the influence of Francis of Assisi, because in his eyes, the poor shepherds were to be especially honored, having first seen and loved the holy child born in poverty. In this image by the Sienese artist Pietro Di Giovanni, the shepherds actually wear the brown habit worn by Franciscan monks. One of the more important images of the adoration of the shepherds is in this panel by Ugo van der Goes, the central panel in what's called the Portinari altarpiece, and it's found in the Uffizi in Florence. That the theme here is combined with the Brigittine nativity type, so that uh, it's almost as if we're entering this scene, joining this quiet circle of worshipers, uh, uniting us in that sense of awe. And so the symbols quietly convey the essence of what has occurred and what will come to be. Shoes cast aside tell us that the scene is taking place on holy ground, this being a symbol that's derived from the story of Moses before the burning bush. 
The accompanying angels are dressed in very ecclesiastical garb, as you can see. And actually, they are the liturgical invest investments that would have been worn by those participating in the ordination of a new priest. The only robes not depicted are those of the new priest himself. And that priest, of course, is the Holy Child, born to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, according to the book of Hebrews. So we see him lying here vulnerable and defenseless on the ground, as is typical uh, in images of the Brigittine type. And there are also symbols alluding to Christ's coming passion. You see the column to the left recalls his flagellation at the hands of Pilate. And the sheaf of wheat, both visually and metaphorically, parallels the body of Christ, pointing to the bread of the Eucharist and the body that was broken for the sins of many. Even the flowers form part of the circle of worshipers that surround this holy child, so that according to the flower symbolism of the day, the red lily on account of its color refers to Christ's passion. The white irises point to Mary's purity, while the blue iris alludes to the sword that Simeon foretold would pierce Mary's heart, a prophecy that points to one of the so-called seven sorrows of Mary. And Mary's sorrow is evident in her melancholic expression. She seems to know that the joy of this moment is not going to last. She probably knew the suffering servant song of Isaiah that was meant to foretell the fate of the Messiah. And one little detail that you see above her head in the tympanum of the doorway behind her, you see a harp. And this is a symbol of David, again, attesting to the Davidic ancestry of the Messiah. So while the shepherds departed with songs of praise, the scripture says that Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. So even in the midst of her sorrow, here is the Messiah, surrounded by the emblems of his kingship. No wonder that the artist has sought to communicate that attitude of reverence and awe, challenging us also to fall down and worship him. Baroque artists often represented the scene taking place at night. Here, Domenichino shows this theme taking on a Baroque exuberance, and that exuberance was typical art of the Counter-Reformation. And so that the rich orchestration of color, conveying a sense of joy, spirit of praise that surrounds the event, and here again, we see a bagpipe playing shepherd who is accompanying to the, uh, contributing to the merriment as he plays uh, this bagpipe. A similar spirit of joy and rich coloring is also conveyed in the work of Philippe de Champagne, uh, that the light emanates from the infant Jesus himself, penetrating the surrounding darkness to illuminate all the figures, including the airborne angels, but the festivities are tempered as we view the bound lamb, the sacrificial animal, <clears throat> lying on the ground. Its vulnerable posture points ahead to the passion when Christ would fulfill his sacrificial mission to atone for the sins of humankind. Our focus now, however, is on the warmth of the Christmas season, with reflection on Christ's passion being reserved for another time, and potentially another webinar. Gerrit uh, von Honthorst, a Dutch artist who worked primarily in Italy, captures the warmth of the war uh, and promise of Christmas in this image, one of the highlights of the Uffizi collection in Florence. Here the artist conveys a more quiet, more inward spirituality than what we've seen in the works of other Baroque artists, so that he focuses more on the transforming power of God's incarnation, as you see that the faces are being transfigured by the light emanating, emanating from the Christ child. And so the artist gives visual expression to the incarnational image from the Gospel of John. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. For the Gospel writer, that drama of light and darkness captures the idea of good and evil competing for victory, and the assertion of the ultimate triumph of Christ's light over the darkness of the world then is an eloquent statement of the hope which is ours to claim at this season in the midst of a world filled with violence, unjust occupation, terrorism, and war. So that John reminds us of the invincibility of Christ's ethic of love and nonviolence, that no matter how dark things may seem as they do currently, 
in Ukraine and Gaza. God is still with us through the coming of the Christ child. So this has been a brief overview of that evolving iconography surrounding the Christmas story as depicted in art from the early Christian era through the Baroque period. And the hope is that it can enhance your experience of the coming Advent season as we await the arrival of the Prince of Peace. And so I'll now invite Audrey to uh, join me as we share in this little litany and prayer to conclude this. God who dispels all darkness, come to be with us and to fill us with your light during this Advent season. Come to fill the distances that divide and separate us. Come to reconcile us with you and with one another. God of light, open our hearts to the mystery of your love and the invitation of your grace. Let our complacency give way to conversion and our judgments to compassionate acceptance of others. Turn oppression to justice and transform conflict to peaceful accord. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who draws near to us in this season, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So let me stop sharing and see if we have any further questions. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. You've shown us, um, you've enriched our faith, and you've shown us your passion that you have for, um, for the for the art. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I have one. Um, I cannot remember the earliest art that you showed us, that mosaic. How early was that? Well, the earliest one actually was a fresco that was in the catacomb of Priscilla oh, right. from the third century. And actually, the catacomb of Priscilla is one of the catacombs that many tourists don't get to. They go to the ones uh, that are uh, near the Via Appia, the catacomb of San Sebastiano and San Callistos. But this is on the Via Solaria in Rome. So when you go to Rome, I would really encourage people to go to uh, the catacomb of Priscilla. You'll be guided by nuns uh, who take you through the catacombs. So so how do you spell that? the name of the catacomb? Well, it's kind of like Priscilla, but I see Priscilla. The, okay. the pronunciation yeah. Priscilla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marjorie. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too. All right. There's another question. Do you have a favorite depiction of the nativity, Richard? If so, why is it your favorite? Well, I think maybe of all the ones that I've shown, uh, the one by Lorenzo Lotto may mm -hmm. be my favorite. Um, it's rich in coloring. It's uh, one that has that cross uh, crucifix in the back that illustrates the idea that uh, you know, that idea of uh, Christ's death, even at the time of his birth. And I just love that detail of the angels singing from this unfurled musical score because they don't know the words. I love it, too. I thought that was very humorous, actually. And why do some have halos and others not? Was well, that, was that be, like in an era thing, a trend? Yes, it is. That increasingly, um, as you move from the Middle Ages, where the halos were more prominent, into the Renaissance that artists gradually would um, kind of modify the halos. Uh, in the medieval era, it was just a flat plate behind their head. Uh, and then as you get into the early Renaissance, it becomes foreshortened kind of as a, a disc floating above their head. Uh, and then gradually it uh, becomes just a little circle of gold yeah. uh, that was there and ultimately it disappears entirely, yeah. Anyone else? Please unmute and ask your question or make your comment. Someone um, has said, very yeah. interesting yeah. webinar. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Another That's person has said, what a treat. Thank you. Yeah, Lee, you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask if you're familiar with um, Kelly Latmore. Um, he does uh, modern iconography um, and has some really interesting depictions of the nativity. I didn't know if you'd if you'd seen yeah, those, but they're fascinating. A, that's a gap in my knowledge. Um, I'm a medieval and Renaissance art historian, and that's where I put my emphasis. So uh, thank you for sharing the name, and uh, I'll check it out. Richard, do you would you have a comment on on uh, the contemporary uh, preferences to portray the nativity in cultural uh, contextual terms? 
Yeah. So that when you're in Latin America, then they're all indigenous or right. brown. In Africa, they're black and so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah, and that's appropriate. Um, one of the critiques, of course, of Renaissance and medieval art is uh, that the figures are look like contemporaries from their own day rather than Jews of Palestine uh, of the day. And that is a legitimate criticism, I think. And so uh, it is, I think, if I were to do a presentation and enhance my knowledge beyond uh, my limited areas of expertise, that would be something to do is to look at how it has been interpreted in other cultures. Well, um, Audrey, should we go on to look at the tour? Sure, yes. And if there's somebody else who has a comment, just don't hesitate, just put it in the chat and hopefully I'll see it and we can uh, talk about it when he's finished presenting the tour. Okay, let me kind of get rid of that. And, and we will also post um, uh, in the chat, Sandra will later on <clears throat> post where you can uh, link to the tour information on our website, and it'll also be in the recording that you'll receive after the seminar, after the webinar. Go ahead, Richard. So, so um, perhaps you got a glimpse from the presentation how much uh, the art uh, just really. Um, is something that I have a great passion for, and particularly the art of Florence. And so I'm really pleased to offer this tour, uh, the Pilgrimage of Faith and Art, because I believe that Christian iconography, re reflecting on it, can enhance our own faith. That you have to remember that during the uh, Middle Ages into the Renaissance, that very few people could go to Jerusalem and actually view the sites of Christ's birth and uh, passion and such. And so people would look at this art as something of a meditative pilgrimage. And that's what I'm proposing for this trip. So we'll begin on September 17th, late afternoon. You'll check into your hotel. We'll go out to dinner together and I'll give a brief orientation to the tour. And the tour will begin the following morning as we look at the cathedral complex, uh, the baptistry, the Duomo, the Campanile, that's the bell tower and um, talks about some of the stories about how Brunelleschi got the design uh, commission to do the dome. And then we'll move on to the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, the Cathedral Museum, where you'll see the actual bronze doors from the baptistry. There are copies on the baptistry now. Uh, and we'll see other sculptures like Michelangelo's Florentine Pietà, created for his own tomb, and Donatello's Mary Magdalene. Lots of stories that I'll tell about those pieces. But we'll move on to the Bargello, the National Sculpture Museum, where you'll see the competition panels uh, between Lorenzo Ghiberto and Filippo Gruleschi to determine who would win the competition to do the bronze doors for the north side of the baptistry. Uh, and we'll talk about why um, Ghiberti probably uh, did win that given the uh, details of his panel. We'll also look at sculptures by Donatello, his bronze David, uh, and also works by Michelangelo, including his drunken Bacchus. Then we'll go on to the Church of Santa Croce, the Franciscan Church in Florence, looking at these two chapels by uh, painted by Giotto, and also that Baroncelli Chapel that we saw in the presentation, and also the various tombs there, because it's kind of the pantheon of Florence, and here's the tomb of Michelangelo. And there are a number of other important figures who are buried there. And then you'll go out to lunch on your own and I'll give you a list of some of my favorite restaurants uh, where you can find authentic uh, Tuscan Casalinga cuisine. Uh, and then you'll have the afternoon free for touring and shopping and such. The next day we'll focus on civic life in Florence by beginning in the Piazza della Signoria and uh, the looking at the Palazzo Vecchio and the Loggia dei Lanzi from the exterior, uh, this being the city hall. And it's there that Michelangelo's David was originally placed. That's a copy there now. And uh, across from that is Baccio Bandinelli's Hercules and Cacus that Michelangelo criticizes representing a sack of potatoes. He wasn't impressed by that work. And the Loggia dei Lanzi with its other sculptural uh, monuments in that open air museum. 
Then we'll move on to the Uffizi, the most important painting gallery in Florence. We'll start by looking at uh, the works from the 13th and 14th century, Cimabue and Giotto here, and trace the evolution of Florentine painting as we move into the 15th century and Gentile da Fabriano's um, Adoration of the Magi and Filippo Lippi's uh, Madonna with the Smiling Angel and tell the story of how he created a beautiful painting, but at the same time, same time created a son. Uh, and then the mythological works by Botticelli, of course, and then continuing up into the high Renaissance uh, with works uh, by Raphael and here Michelangelo's Doni Tondo. Uh, then we'll work past Orsan Michele, just noticing the exterior sculptures there, their copies. Later in the week, we'll see the originals in the museum. But on our way to uh, the Palazzo Davanzati, which is the Museum of the Renaissance House. Uh, and it's a really fun uh, place to see where how people did live, certainly the upper middle class lived during the Renaissance period. And we'll conclude the day at Santa Trinita, a uh, church uh, that is uh, Gothic in its structure, you see. And we'll um, stop at one of the chapels being the Sassetti Chapel. And we'll meet uh, the patron, Francesco Sassetti, later uh, in the week as we go to the Villa La Pietra, which was his home. And actually, we'll pass by the Palazzo Strozzi uh, in that area as well, uh, built for the richest man in Florence, Filippo Strozzi, toward the end of the 15th century. And then a lunch on your own, pointing you to, again, some of the uh, tartaria that I really like. Uh, and I should warn you that the Palazzo Strozzi, where we end, is on the Via Tornaboni, which is the most fashionable shopping district in Florence. So bring your credit cards with you for that afternoon that you'll have on your own. The next day, we'll focus on the Medici family, beginning at the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, going into the central courtyard where Donatello's Bronze David was originally displayed and concluding at the Chapel of the Magi, uh, where you'll see portraits of the Medici family in this painting by Bonozzo Gozzoli in, in the chapel. We'll go on to the Medici Church of San Lorenzo, where many of them are buried. They're looking at their tombs, but also looking for some of the other artistic treasures there, this being Filippo Lippi's Annunciation. Then we'll go on to the Medici chapels, uh, where you'll see these sculptures by Michelangelo, paint, uh, sculpted later in his career. And then on to the Laurentian Library that he designed, uh, uh, going up this staircase that almost feels like it's flowing down as you go up into the room where the manuscripts are displayed in these cases and looking at some of the medieval manuscripts and Renaissance works that were owned by the Medici. And then um, we're going to have to get a quick lunch on this afternoon on your own. But what I'm proposing is to go to the Mercato Centrale, the central market, uh, and where you can pick up a, a quick lunch. And I'll probably be in line at uh, Narbonne, where you can get the most delicious pork sandwiches that you'll find anywhere in the world. Uh, because we need to have uh, gather again in the afternoon to go to this tour of Villa La Pietra, where I taught those classes for Southern Methodist University in an adjacent uh, villa there, the Villa Sassetti. Uh, but this is the 15th century villa that was owned by Francesco Sassetti and later owned by the Acton family, who formed one of the most important private art collections in Florence that we'll have a private tour of. And then we'll also see the gardens at the Villa La Pietra. And from there, the bus will take us to the Church of San Miniato a Monte, where we'll uh, be able to participate in the worship, the Gregorian chant of the monks in the crypt. And also um, very nearby is the Piazzale Michelangelo, where you'll be able to get your iconic photos of the panoramic view of Florence. On Saturday, we'll start by going to the Old Arno region, the region across the Arno at the Church of Santo Spirito, designed by Brunelleschi. And one of the treasures we see there is the crucifix that was sculpted by the young Michelangelo as a gift to the monks who allowed him to dissect corpses uh, before they were buried so that he could understand the underlying human anatomy. 
And then from there, we'll go on to the Brancacci Chapel at the Church of Santa Maria del Carmine, uh, where we really have the beginnings of Renaissance painting in the work of Masaccio. And we'll pass by the Palazzo Pitti on our way back to the other side of the Arno. We will not be going into the Palazzo Pitti, but I would point out in one of your freedoms, you may want to go in because that's the second most important painting collection in Florence in the Capella, I mean, in the Galleria Palatina. And we'll also stop briefly at the Church of Santa Felicita to look at one of the most important mannerist works, late Renaissance works by uh, Jacopo Pontormo. And then we'll go back to Orsan Michele to go into the museum there. It's only open very rarely. Uh, and so see the originals of the sculptures that we would have previously seen the niches on the exterior. Uh, and then again, lunch on your own. Maybe it's time to get a bistecca fiorentina uh, or maybe tagliatelle al tartufo with truffles. Uh, and then the morning of Sunday, we'll go to uh, what's known uh, as the Profumeria for short. This is the pharmacy that was originally set up by the monks of Santa Maria Novella where they grew various flowers, extracted fragrances, and one can still smell those fragrances as you go into the Profumeria. We'll stop there on our way to worship for those that want to go to the St. James Episcopal Church for Sunday morning worship. And then there's a restaurant that we'll stop at after the service to have pizza together. Uh, and that is one of the covered meals. Uh, and uh, that's an enticement for you to go to worship with us that you're gonna get your lunch for free. And uh, then um, also we want to keep people together because we're then go on a tour of the Dominican Church of Santa Maria Novella in the afternoon, and you'll have the rest of the afternoon and evening for yourself. And then Monday is when we go to Siena and San Gimignano. Uh, we'll see the riches of Siena, have lunch together there in the afternoon and conclude by visiting the Palazzo Publico. And on our way back to Florence, we'll stop at San Gimignano a uh, town with all of its towers reflecting uh, in very well-preserved medieval character of this town. Uh, and then uh, our last day, we'll start at the uh, little um, refectory of San Apollonia with this Last Supper by Andrea del Castaño. Uh, go on to the Academia, where the main attraction is Michelangelo's David, but also his known finiti, the unfinished sculptures. And it's also the site of many other important paintings and sculptures. And we'll go then to the uh, Ospedale degli Innocenti, uh, looking at the exterior of Brunelleschi's earliest commission in Florence. And then uh, in the same piazza, we'll go to the Church of Santissima Annunziata and look at the paintings there. Uh, and then uh, go on to the Museo di San Marco, uh, where we'll visit the monk cells, uh, that each of them with a Fra Angelico painting in them. Uh, and we'll conclude that tour that morning at the Chiostro della Scalzo with these monochromatic paintings uh, by Andrea del Sarto. And then afternoon, lunch is on your own, free time in the afternoon, but we'll regather in the evening for a farewell dinner. Uh, and so the next morning is when you check out of the hotel, either travel home, or go on to independent travel into other parts of Italy or beyond. So I'm hoping that that uh, entices you to join us on this tour. Okay, let me again stop sharing and see what other comments or questions you have about the tour. Well, if does anybody have any last question they would like to ask at this point in time? That's your last chance. No? Well, Richard, thank you. What a wonderful presentation and the tour, uh, as I said last evening, when you came to us with this tour, we I was very excited and immediately I said, I'm going. So I would be, we would be delighted if the rest of you were enthusiastic and wanted to join Richard on this pilgrimage of faith and art in Florence. And I actually see people online that have been encouraging me to do this. So I'm hoping they're going to join me. Well, that's that's good. I hope they will, too. 
and we will process your registration immediately as soon as you uh, go to our website and fill it out and make your deposit. Well, Richard, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. We hope that Richard's presentation will enhance your celebration um, during this Advent season. And if there's nothing else, I will say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Blessings to everyone. Thanks, thank Richard. You thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you.